Sam is the best best type, the tree order. Uh, the, the other thing I want to mention is when we use the linearized effective uh, field equation, uh, it's only reliable at the late times. That's because we do not do the initial state correction. All the inter uh, interacting theory, we need to uh, correct the initial state, but we do not do that. So it's only reliable at late times. And the, the other thing is we know uh, the gravity class matter is not a reliable it's not a renalizable theory, so that means uh, you always have an arbitrary uh, piece, a finite part of color term, uh, which have not fixed uh, by the, any physical principle. So that means uh, you just uh, make uh, the slightly change of finite part of the color terms, then the prediction from this theory entirely different. So this is why we look at the late tide, because the late tide you can find the sun tide dependent and the grow in peace. And this piece is very big compared with the, the finite change. So this is why we only use at the late tide and only reliable at the late tides. Uh, for this dynamical case, uh, you will find out the uh, electric field growing, but the uh, magnetic field actually is not growing, it's uh, four. So you have an extra uh, scale factor in the denominator. So uh, this is the result for the dy dynamical photons one. And actually, uh, perturbation of I will not mention this, let me uh, talk about something else later. Before I report uh, 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 this data, uh, which if we put a different source, for example, the photocharge or dipole, or uh, this uh, a magnetic dipole, uh, uh, actually we uh, look at it in uh, two different observers. One is we call the co-moving observer. Why is the co-moving observer? That is the source, the physical distance between the source and the observer. Uh, this distance keep growing, okay? And uh, the manifold corresponds to, that is you just uh, cut half of this four decimal manifold, and the upper part is the is the co-moving uh, coordinates. And uh, the other we call static coordinates. That is the physical distance between uh, the source and observer is constant in time, okay? This is smaller, much smaller manifold here, but uh, you only need to remember these two things. Uh, one is physical distance growing, the other is fixed, and it do not change with time. Okay, so this is the result. Uh, this, is this, uh, this, uh, this is the result of the sitter, and uh, the first, uh, uh, we look at uh, it at uh, co-moving observer. Uh, this is for the uh, for the charge. This is for the magnetic di dipole moment. Uh, you will see, okay, this is case for piece. And the second piece, actually is a uh, uh, Rakowski piece. I don't know if you still remember or not. That is the piece we get here, to this one. You see this is a G over R squared, the basic behavior. <coughs> so this is extra piece. We this have a this piece also have a base space type uh, analog. But this is a new piece entirely due to the inflation in this uh, uh, decitor. And uh, for the cooling potential you see even this uh, have a cooling parameter, the small cooling parameter. But uh, it actually have a high growing piece, is lower than A. And the other part, you can see, okay, this is gauge potential. And also, they have classical piece. And uh, this is the uh, Rakowski piece, also have a uh, phase space type analog. This is the uh, Gisita piece, the new piece. But you will see for the magnetic dipole, uh, this, uh, the uh, effects do not uh, enhance, okay, because it is uh, lower than A, but here it doesn't show any lower than A. And uh, also we can uh, look at uh, this effects at the static coordinates. When you look at the static coordinates, at least it's changed. Uh, the same here is classical piece is the uh, Rakowski piece. It's a, also has a phase space time envelope. And this one doesn't grow with time, okay? This is just opposite. You see here, this is a magnetic dipole one. This is the electric part, and this is the magnetic part. It's become very, very complicated. 
you can see the cases here, you will see this time drawing because the logarithm A in the denominator, you have the extra minus sign. Also, you see this logarithm A here, you compare this term with this term, okay? You have a M to a K, this also has M to K. So this is also time drawing. If you compare this part with this part, okay? Uh, because extra minus sign outside, so this part also has time drawing term. And uh, the reason for the static coordinates, we find out the cooling potential uh, doesn't intense the, and uh, for the magnetic dipole intense. And uh, the reason we don't really understand why it happened this way. Finally, uh, what I want to talk about is the gauge issue. Uh, when you, you when you calculate this uh, Feynman diagram, then uh, you will encounter the photon propagator and the graviton propagators. And uh, as soon as you want to get the propagator, you need to do the gauge fixing. The photon propagator actually is not the, uh, will not uh, affect, affect the result. That is because you see from the Lagrangian. See from the Lagrangian. At the new new, this piece actually is gauge independent. So why the gauge you choose to get the photon propagator? I mean, it doesn't change the final result. The result will be matter will be the graviton propagator one. When you try to fix uh, the gauge uh, to get the graviton propagator, you use a different uh, gauge, then the result will be changed. So uh, this is a face based type uh, vacuum of poly uh, polymerization. And uh, you know the face based type actually has the Poincare events. Okay, so uh, this you, you can see it takes this form. And uh, we also know the transverse property of the vacuum polarization. That means you take a D upper mu uh, to this uh, quantity, it must uh, give a zero. So you can see this is also unique determinant. You can have a lot of different uh, Poincaré event structure here, but in order to get the d mu acting up here to zero, you must have this form. So you fix it by two properties, transverse condition and also Poincaré events. And this part is also fixed by Poincaré events and the dimensional analysis. Kappa square is just stands for this one loop result. Okay? The only thing is ambiguous lazy coefficient in front of here. Okay? The coefficient is not unique, fixed. That is because you know the vacuum polarization is not uh, gauge, indep gauge independent quantity. Okay, you can see the C two. C two is a spin two part. Okay, it's vanishing at d equal to four. C zero. That is spin zero part. And this is a heavily depend on the gauge. V is arbitrary number, so it heavily depends the gauge. And uh, the way to fix this ambiguous. Uh, a coefficient here, that is uh, the, we uh, compare the results of this uh, Toyota ball. Uh, when you compute its gauge independent S matrix, uh, calculate this uh, uh, charge particle scattering, okay? Then he used the inverse scattering theorem to infer why it's uh, cooling potential. And then uh, suppose you have this cooling potential, ask what would be the vacuum polarization. So uh, the vacuum polarization <coughs> infer from the result of a mu of ball is gauge independent piece and compare this piece with this one so you can uniquely uniquely fix the ambiguous coefficient here. This is a phase based type, okay? So in phase based type you do not have problem because you have gauge independent as matrix to compare with. What is P? What is the physics of this P? Oh, this is just an arbitrary number. Like, uh, it's a gauge it, it does something, right? B cannot be two. Uh, B can be two. Oh, okay. Well, but you say arbitrary. So what does it mean? Uh, you mean just the gauge property? Oh, okay. I think that you know. Uh, you mean the B cannot be two because you diverge here, right? Yeah. So except the B equal two, uh, it can be arbitrary. It's just to uh, tell you uh, how heavily it depends on the gauge. You can choose, for example, B equal to one, 
for b equal to 3 or blah, blah, blah. You just uh, can assume the speed is your part. And the uh, VH dependence is being too far, doesn't it? This is something about the gauge independence, but uh, your pi mu nu does depend on b, so but b can be arbitrary. So, no, I, so I'm asking just uh, what I just don't get it uh, when you say this is a for current events, right? You see, this is constraint of the new, and uh, you can choose the gauge, for example, b equal to one or b equal to three, not b equal to two. Okay, this is except the b equal to two. I mean, the, this statement uh, just uh, try to uh, say this is uh, ambiguous part, okay, and the uh, speed zero is uh, gauge dependent, and uh, this is gauge dependent, and then we try to fix the ambiguous by compare with the results derived from the gauge independent as magic. So you can fix the ambiguous part here. Well, <coughs> you do a gauge dependent calculation and you have to compare with someone else's gauge independent calculation? Yes. But this is faster, you're saying? The faster? Yeah. I, I mean, if there I, is well, a gauge Well, I don't know the other way to fix the ambiguous, ambiguity here. This is the only way I know. I don't, because it's not that you calculate the other different things, but the, when you talk about uh, vacuum polarization, this is gauge fixed the grid function. It's not gauge key. So of course you you have an arbitrary uh, gauge block here. Okay, it's ambiguous. And uh, before we go on the gauge issue on this data, I want to uh, emphasize the three misconception about gauge issues. The first, uh, fourth statement is uh, gauge fixed grid function are complete nonsense. Okay, because you say gauge fixed grid function is gauge dependent. So anything uh, gauge dependent, uh, then it's not physical observable. So we can just uh, throw it away. So it's nonsense. But this is not true. Why is not true? Because we know the phase space time gauge independent as matrix. How do you construct this gauge independent as matrix? Actually, it's formed by uh, each uh, gauge dependent grid function. The way the people just uh, find a way to separate the physical part of gauge fixed grid function from the unphysical part. And the, uh, so they can form gauge independent as matrix. So this means even the gauge dependent, uh, fix, uh, gauge fixed uh, this dependent grid function is still contains some physical information doesn't mean you can just uh, throw it away, or it doesn't mean it's entirely nonsense. Okay, this is the first. The second, uh, gauge invariant grid function are different from gauge fixed grid function. What I mean is, okay, uh, you say gauge invariant uh, uh, grid function. If you compute the value of uh, this gauge invariant grid function, you get gauge independent. Okay, so we only need to consider. Uh, try to find the operator, gauge invariant is enough. But I will say this is not true. Why? You see, this A1, okay, in this total temporal gauge, you can write down the A1 as this bounding way of gauge invariant operator, right? So this is also gauge uh, invariant. It's not different from gauge invariant here. You can say, okay, this is bounding and uh, it doesn't make physical sense. To do, it, uh, to do this way, you can make a criticism like this. But uh, you only say, okay, uh, for the observable, physical observable, we only need to find the gauge invariant operator. This is not true. Okay. And actually, for the wood thesis with the Stanley Besser, actually, they actually uh, this called the Mendes covariance uh, for gravity in phase space time. Uh, this is 
uh, entirely gauge independent non-local function, and uh, when you expand it out, uh, you will find out each is sum of gauge fixed degrees function. Okay. So the second point is, okay, you only try to find the gauge invariant operator is not enough, doesn't guarantee you to give the physical observable. Okay. For example, one, one is gauge invariant operator, but it didn't tell you anything. Uh, the third one is, okay, you just find the gauge invariant operator, and uh, this is so trivial, why bother to talk about this gauge issue? This is not true, because as uh, the Friedman Robinson Walker or Isida, we do not have well defined as matrix, and uh, it, we do not have the way to, come to fix a new ambiguous part by compare with this is a gauge independent as matrix on uh, base space time. Okay? So in Isida, a Friedman Robinson Walker, we do not have well defined as matrix. So how, how, how can you say this is a tri trivial problem? It's not trivial at all. We don't know how to do it. So at the moment, uh, you might try, you, what you might do or you, what you can do is try to find some operator which roughly corresponds to what is B major, okay? So but this is <coughs> an issue I want to mention. Well, I'm a little bit confused here. I think uh, if you have a gauge parameter, I thought the conventional wisdom is that for a physical process, it should be gauge invariant because experimentalists do not need to know your gauge. So therefore, for a computation of a physical measurable, the gauge parameter should cancel away. So if you, so how do you know that you have actually computed correctly? Uh, I think uh, what you mean is uh, why we know which gauge invariant operator corresponds to the thing we measure is your question, right? So I'm just saying that like, like the traditional RQC gauges, <coughs> you explicitly check that the gauge parameter cancels away if you compute a physical amplitude. Yes, that's right. So that's the control. Yeah, but the, 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 this kind of piece we call gauge independent. Because for example, you can find a lot of uh, operator, okay, for example, that is one. For example, if you write up A1 in this form of temporal gauge, you can write you can express it in terms of uh, this uh, ds, I mean this kind of invariant form. But if you, in a different gauge, you might write down in a different kind of invariant form, okay? So invariant is not enough, you must ask uh, the gauge independent. For example, like a wave of f mu mu, f mu mu, that is gauge independent. It's also gauge invariant. And also for a physical observable, of course physical observable must be gauge independent, also gauge invariant. But, uh, on, but you can have a lot of uh, gauge invariant operator, but gauge invariant operator is not necessary to guarantee this is a physical observable, because this is a bigger scope. Okay. But physical observable, what I mean is physical observable must have this property that's gauge independent and also gauge invariant. But gauge invariant operator is not necessary corresponding to, to the physical observable. Okay. Okay, please go on. Okay, so for the decita, it will find the growing piece like logarithm A. And uh, we also find out that you can uh, use the cos uh, correspondence limit uh, because they have a phase space type descent. And uh, uh, so it will make a one conjecture. What is gauge independent one? The conjecture is maybe the leader, uh, the leading secular effects is gauge independent. Uh, the first uh, is because this kind of secure growth uh, it doesn't exist in phase space time. And the second, even in the phase space time, why do you think this leading uh, time growing piece could be gauge independent? Because if you try to look at the space time, for example, the uh, gauge independent as, as matrix, the physical part will be the whole terms of uh, gauge fixed degrees function. And when you do the spatial free transform of uh, this whole terms of gauge fixed degrees function, will correspond to, when you do the spatial free, free transform, you will get some high dependent growing turn and uh, become very, very big because pole means divergence. And uh, this is analog to a deceit uh, secular growth. And this is why we make this conjecture. Okay? But this is just a conjecture we don't know. So how do we check? The thing you can check is, okay, the very obvious way, just that we do the same computation. 
use the different gauge. Okay. Uh, so the this uh, vacuum polarization we will talk about previous here. We use uh, this uh, two uh, simple representation. We compute it in our visitor. We compute it using the old Gretel propagator. Uh, and the late Gretel propagator actually breaks the secret inverse. And uh, now, uh, we say, OK, we want to know this leading secret uh, in phase, gauge independent or not, then you really compute in other gauge. The photon gauge doesn't matter because this invariant one was a gauge independent one. But the Gretel one, it matter, and also, uh, more of Tom Thomas and Wood, they find out the covariant, uh, do the covariant is a gauge fixing and get a new kind of uh, greater propagator. And uh, this is why, at the risk of the, uh, we try to recompute vacuum polarization using a new uh, greater propagator. Here, I just uh, show why we use them. Uh, the simple way. This is a simple way that it's uh, the, all the graphic propagator we do not rescale the graph field. Uh, we rescale the graph field, conformal rescale. And uh, the graph propagator actually takes this form. Very simple. Why is it simple? Because the only three turns are together and the pace apart is all constant. Okay? And also, the scale apart, we have three piece, A, B, C. Uh, they all terminate at e equal to four. That means uh, at e equal to four, even though in d dimension they have infinite series uh, summation, but in d equal to four, it takes very simple form like this. And then because of this, even though it breaks the decimal difference, but it's very simple to use and easy to compute uh, whatever object you want. And uh, right now, uh, the thing you have to play using this algorithm uh, propagator is you need a non invariant counters. And a lot of uh, mathematical oriented the physicists hate this because they want to maintain the beauty of uh, this inference. And uh, this is a new gauge, new covariant gauge. Okay. In this gauge, we do not rescale the couple we scale the graph time. And uh, the graph time propagator become very, very complicated. Uh, it consists of spin two part and the spin zero part. And the spin two part is this junk. Uh, this is the projection operator at x. Projection operator at x prime. Each projection operator consists of a four derivative, covariant derivative. So four, four is eight covariant derivative, adding on this function. Okay, this is uh, two derivative of y, two derivative of y, and s two. This is spin two part the structural function. So it's very, very, very complicated. You can see compared with the all graph propagator. And the spin zero part is a little bit simpler, but it's still complicated. It also depends on the gauge. Here you can see spin two, a structural function. It's nothing to do with B, this gauge parameter. Okay, it's nothing to do with the gauge dependent, but the inverse decimal for the spin zero part, uh, you have this gauge parameter. Okay, so spin zero part of a structural function depends on B, uh, and also decimal event for D uh, larger than two. You will see, okay, this is very, very complicated, but uh, if you want to check our conjecture, then we have to just uh, do it. Uh, we have no other choice because uh, so far we don't know the better way to do it. And uh, the other comment about the uh, new gauge correct uh, greater propagator is the tensor part, when you expand out the tensor part, it's no longer constant, it's based at pi. And uh, also when you try to expand out at a derivative here, at the four derivative here, it's spread out in D equal to four. Uh, it's, not, it's not no longer simple, or simple like an uh, old one. So this is very, very complicated. And it takes a lot of time for us to do. And also, you say, okay, because uh, a lot of people criticize this uh, why you uh, do not use the uh, decimal event one. Uh, even you use the display event the graph propagator, uh, you still will find out in this case you still need non invariant counter. The reason is the first uh, uh, because the pass integral and also because uh, pass integral form is we usually use the high order. Uh, high order, uh, we do not use the normal ordering. Okay, 
and also because we need to use the sugar package formulas to guarantee the final result are real and causal, so we still uh, still need to maintain this high order ordering. So this high order ordering. The second, uh, the quantum interaction of Greco interaction is a two dirty here. Okay, and uh, this two dirty idea of the scalar part, the structural function part, will pick up the delta function in the spatial direction, for example, in the temporal direction. And uh, when you have a delta function, that means you set out uh, uh, this coordinate with the coincident limit. And the coincident limit of Greta pocket diverge in the spatial uh, direction, this temporal direction. So that means you press the covariant. That means in this case, even you use the deceit covariant kind of uh, Greta pocket, you still need non event constants. And uh, here, finally, let me show you. This is the structural function, okay, two structural function. When we use uh, the all Greta propagator, okay, it's also complicated. But uh, if you look at uh, the one we just recently compute, this spin two part of structural function. Except that the familiar term, for example, like this one, logarithm delta function, or this piece, or this piece. We also have a new term. Uh, this kind of term is a di, uh, di logarithm function here. So this is a new thing. It's also very, very complicated. This only spin two part. And uh, we also have a spin zero part. Okay. So you will find that some terms are uh, familiar. If uh, the new Greta propagates uh, result only give uh, a, a similar term, then it's easier to solve the uh, linear Linearize the effective field equation because it's simpler one, they will not have to do it. They, we can do it very quickly. However, we have a new term, for example, like this kind. It's a very complicated function. And we have not yet proceeded to, to solve the uh, linearized effective field equation and uh, try to find out what will be behavior of the photon. So this is uh, the conclusion so far. We find some terms are the same, but others are different. and. Uh, we still need to resolve the effective field equation to check the congestion. This is very tedious, but it's straightforward. Okay, but uh, we, do, we are very busy and uh, we do not all get together till July 20. Okay, so the other thing is just uh, by intuition, the leading infrared logarithm is uh, really fast, I would say, because you just think of the photon propagates through uh, to a sea of infrared reptiles. And uh, you can imagine this photon can get hit by random walking of infrared virtual gravitons. So the photon's behavior must be changed. It might change the dynamical gravitons, also might change the EM force, right? And uh, this result already can be seen in the phase space time. So why do you doubt uh, this cannot be happened during the primordial inflation? So I will say this is uh, just uh, from intuition. This is a uh, true effect, it's not gauge artifact. But uh, we still need to prove in it because it's an important step in the cosmological quantum field theory. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, questions? So what is the measurable effect, observable effect? Uh, for this calculation, actually, it's a uh, the observable effects are very small because uh, we compute the vacuum polarization and uh, at one loop order, so you already, already carry the uh, GH squared one uh, loop coming from it. So you might think, okay, this, uh, if you put this uh, source term as the uh, Einstein equation, then you can ask, uh, okay, how can this term distort the photon uh, distribution on the cosmic microwave background? But uh, this effect is very, very small. Because uh, the source term of Einstein equation, we have one G there, A pi G something, and the one loop uh, have the other G. So basically, it has G which is square, square. So it's uh, small, very small. It cannot be measured now, but it might be measured uh, maybe 30 years later or 40 years later. Uh, 